Hi, I'm Mia Sines, the Passion Muse. I had the privilege of interviewing Laura Eisenhower, and we noticed during the editing process that I was green and upside down. So you will have the pleasure of seeing just Laura on the screen. We have taken this interview all over. It's packed filled the 30 minutes from this planet and beyond. It's brilliant. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Welcome to Mia the Passion News Show. I'm Mia Signs, your host, and joining me this week is Laura Eisenhower. Welcome, Laura. Hi, Mia. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Laura has this amazing story. She's a spiritualist, and as you'll see, there's so much more. So, Laura, will you begin at the beginning of your story, which is your magnificent history and childhood? It's very rich. Oh, thanks. Uh, it was um, interesting. Uh, you know, pretty early on in my life, I understood just some weird things that uh, really didn't make sense to many other people, so I just sort of internalized it and just sort of, um, I don't know, tried to figure out what, what messages I was getting and what it really meant. And it was really catalytic to be born into the Eisenhower family, because clearly I wasn't groomed to be a politician. I was very much unique, um, and listening to my own self and just sort of... I wouldn't say rebellious, but uh, I, I had an agenda of my own, and um, it really connected to Mother Earth and just to spirit and, you know, really recognizing the imbalance of the masculine and feminine and the assault on the planet, the assault on Gaia, and, uh, I, know, and, I, and I knew there was some sort of dark, sinister agendas, but I couldn't really put my finger on it, but I did have some interesting communications, and beings and even the spirit of my great-grandfather seemed to be preparing me for uh, quite the mission, and um, it had very much to do with you know, somewhat being destroyed or being um, pulled away from my path, and uh, and they even warned me that they're going to try and take you away and all this sort of stuff. And I didn't, you know, fully understand it, but those were some of the things early on. When, and how, when did this begin? Do you, how far back do you remember? Well, I think when I was six years old, I was having, you know, some interesting encounters. I was really feeling in touch with, you know, higher abilities and just, you know, all children are, are in touch with that. Um in a lot of ways, and so I made it really my focus to pay attention, particularly at night when I was sharing the room with my sister. And so we would go to family gatherings, and I would just be sort of looking at the books on the bookshelf and looking through the family albums and sort of realizing that this is just a little bit different, and okay, this man needs to be president, and okay, let's hope he didn't make huge mistakes, like what am I, what am I in for here? And, and then the more I got in contact with the spirit, the more I realized, wow, you know, he's, his presence is really in my life. And it's not like I was dealing with all sorts of beings. Um, right. You know, there was just a few occasions, and he was definitely present. Mm -hmm. So when you were a child and you had these encounters where um, I've heard you speak about, there were also um, other entities, alien entities, and the ones with your grandfather, how did you feel and how did you react to that? Because that's what people become fearful of, and that's why they close down and they don't open up to the grace of the spiritual world. Right. Well, I didn't have that many encounters with beings. There were probably one or two times that really stood out to me. Otherwise, I was just, you know, really just trying to understand myself and connect, you know, with the earth and spirit. Um, but there was, yeah, I mean, we have spirit guides, and there's, I mean, we're in a multidimensional universe with lots of benevolent races, and I definitely, you know, saw a few. And so down the road, I saw some rumors. I remember standing at the grocery store line seeing um, a Weekly World News article about Eisenhower meeting with E.T. But this is Weekly World News where they're also saying, you know, bat people have taken over New York City, and, you know, it's just all crazy stuff. So I was like, oh, that's funny. And but then I was like, wait a second, though. I mean, something in me just was like, I don't know. I feel like there's some truth to this. And I remember being like 12 years old um, and asking, I don't think I asked a whole lot of questions at that point, but... Uh, Nobody was talking. Nobody in my family talked about extraterrestrials. Nobody talked about UFOs, and it was just very much the surface history of Eisenhower. Um, many of my uh, family members had written books. My grandfather, you know, was a big author. They covered a lot of the war stories. But I got really close to my grandfather, um, who's like son, and um, to Julie and David, and Julie's um, Nixon's daughter, and um, really just really got into the heart of the family and really felt close to everybody. And so I was really surprised later on when I found out more with whistleblowers talking about secret meetings and treaties with extraterrestrials. And what I've come to understand is that there's, you know, a couple of races that he dealt with. So I never heard about this growing up. And it wasn't until later that I was able to put the docs together because of some of my own experiences. But, yeah, I mean, people fear it, but, uh, you know, we're made of 
everything in the cosmos in a lot of ways, and um, we're connected to all these beings. And so the more we know ourselves, the more we know how to work with the forces around us. And, um, and then we attract whatever really um, is a match to our vibration. Exactly. If we keep our frequencies higher, we're going to attract higher. That's absolutely right. true. Right. And there might be attacks, you know, when people start the waking up process, but it's just kind of like an initiation. Right. You just got to kind of move through it. Well, don't you think that that's also part of the spiritual growth, that when the attacks happen, we have to either, they, people either close down or they actually awaken and grow. And that's, that's the process, right? Wouldn't, isn't that how you would describe it? I mean, it's our soul remembering who we truly are. Yeah. Definitely, and I, I, I feel like there's like gatekeepers or certain uh, dark lords that stand at the gates of those initiations, and they do everything they can to test you and throw you down and kind of keep you stuck beneath, but, you know, the power of the spirit and just, you know, one's will and deeper knowing about, you know, one's divinity, it, it's really um, just like, you know, the immune system when it faces, you know, viruses and diseases, it, it gets strengthened, you know, right. the more exposure it has and the more that it's willing exactly. to still you know, be open and not hide away in a bubble and, and fear it. You know, you just got to kind of, you know, not put such an emotional charge on it or such an energy to it and recognize that, you know, we're, we're, we're going all the way and we're very superior beings to at least the lower ones. And um, you got to kind of get through them to get to the other side. Um, and if one by, bypasses them completely, that's great. But, you know, adversity and challenges and dark forces are all very alchemical and catalytic. So it's good to remember that. Right, yeah. right. It, it's it's amazing. Um, will you share with us your experience in the wilderness? There was a point in your life where you separated from your family for many years. Was it about 20? Let's see. Um, 1993, I think I was 19. Okay. Yeah, around 20. Um, it was, uh, I had traveled a lot, you know, after leaving high school. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I had been living in the D.C. area. But I dressed like I was about to climb a mountain, so I was like, okay. I hadn't really applied for college. I was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I was so just kind of bent out of shape after just being in that environment. Um, and I knew there was something else. So I just decided to do wilderness courses yes. and um, kind of learn how to survive and to see what I'm all about without human, human projections and whatever they think it's all about. I, I needed to step away from it all because I felt really alienated and, and just, I, I wasn't really having a good experience in high school. And, and anyway, it was amazing because I learned so much. Um, I, I probably spent about two years all together, um, not counting a lot of, you know, different road trips and, of, you know, a lot of adventures that I went on myself. And I, that was really just where I, I, I realized, you know, I, I, uh, I am pressed, so I am grounded, I am connected, I am whole, and I am intelligent. But before that, I, I didn't have many of those thoughts about myself at all, but it almost just, like, pulled the pulled me out of me, and um, and I just fell in love with the environment. I fell, fell in love with just all the different elements and um, really learned how to work with groups in really stressful situations, and I really learned how to work with energy, and that's what I was paying most attention to is the power of nature and the power of miracles and our connection to that, and I, and I refer to it all the time, you know, currently, even though I don't do those kind of trips anymore. Right, which is really amazing because your website is um, uh, Cosmic Gaia, and you're talking about Mother Earth. And um, it's really beautiful when people, I always have my clients, connect to nature as much as they can. You growing up in D.C., you didn't have much of the nature. So you couldn't go out and, I don't want to say hug a tree because you're not a tree hugger, but um, it truly is powerful to feel the vibration coming off of these living, breathing um, objects. Yeah, well, I did, um, actually, when I was a kid, I was a tomboy, so I was always in the trees, and I was always, you know, outside, and we lived in upstate New York before we moved to D.C., but you're right, but the minute I got there, it was just like, that, I think because of the contrast, I realized what I was really missing, it was hard to just kind of go with the program, and um, so I skipped school a lot, and I went and found my little spots to just commune, because to me, that was my real teacher. It is. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's truly amazing. When, when you, what are some of the feelings and the spiritual revelations that you felt you got by being in, as you call it, the wilderness? I know when I'm out in nature, my being totally transforms. I can actually pull nature in living in the cities because I have to. I go on walks and I'm actually absorbed in the leaves and the colors and the scents and the smell and I look at the grass and the flowers. I, I get it where, we can get it wherever we are if we have to. So 
So regarding your wilderness thing, how, how did it change your, your whole being? I understand that you connected vibrationally, but can you expand on that a little bit? Because it's very interesting for people to understand the correlation between spirituality and Mother Earth or planet. don't recognize just how much of that there is. <clears throat> Our soul essence, and we see this in astrology and Chinese medicine, is made up the, of the elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Yes. Um, and we have different sort of affinities and, you know, stronger aspects based on our natal chart. But the point is, we're made up of everything we see in nature. We have animal spirits within us, which Native Americans understand. Mm-hmm. So when we're really in a vibration that's clear and we're not in our ego or in any sort of mental programming, we have such a direct connection. And when I was out there, it's just like it just seemed like miracle after miracle is happening. You know, dolphins just sort of swimming around, the whales, and just, the communication, even, you know, rattlesnakes, like, I remember one campsite, there was, like, rattlesnakes near every bush. Everywhere you walked, you could just hear their rattle going. They were wrapped around our food bags, and, you know, normally, I, I would probably think of that and say, oh, gosh, I don't know about that, that's a little freaky. Mm-hmm. But when I was there, I was just like, oh, I was just embracing it. It was like, oh, rattlesnake. There were scorpions, actually, a girl, we hiked about, oh, God, that day, 13 miles or something, ridiculous. She had no instructors with us. She took off her hat at the end of it, and the scorpion crawled out and she had it on her cap the whole hike and it was just like you know and all these people are supposed about money and we're in this like weird matrix but then you know when you put yourself out there it's like it's so dangerous at times yeah. but when you're in co-creation it's like you're working with the forces you're in relationship to it you're speaking to it and it's teaching right. you and you're learning something and as long as you recognize that and you don't think you're superior or inferior and you recognize that you are in that oneness right. then incredible things happen and and then, of course, the fifth element is spirit, and that's what's really alchemical, and it allows our spirit to really not have dominion over nature, but to enable miracles and deeper connection. Mm-hmm. Why do you think it is um, many, many people throughout, you know, for thousands of years throughout history have gone off onto these type of wilderness journeys? You just reminded me of, of my summers in Yosemite as, as a young woman in a, in a girls' group, um, hiking and for for a week up into uh little yosemite valley and past there and and how amazing it was connection those tiny paths that you walk on climbing up the hills when you're backpacking and you have to grab a rock and you're so grateful that the rock is there that you can grab so you don't slide off the cliff that type of feeling it's really it's really magnificent to the soul why do you think we have these type of um exterior from our body and normal situation why do you think that we grow so much when we do these wilderness journeys i'm, I'm really glad that we're talking about this because oh, I, I, know. Totally, I, I totally forgot about that i mean it's brilliant i know i don't talk about this enough so i'm so glad um wow i think we just gained so much because we get in touch with that the sort of inner power that we have that warrior that um that earth guardian, I mean, just all these different archetypes that are very organic start to show up rather than mm-hmm. the programming that we got from the media or from the television growing up. And, you know, and that just can feel so ridiculous and artificial. And I think, you know, people just long for that feeling and that essence because it just provides just a feeling of ecstasy and bliss, especially at the end of the day. Maybe, you know, on the hike grabbing the rock, it didn't feel so comfortable. But at the end of the day, when you're just lying on the earth and you just feel her nurturing and her unconditional love. I mean, Mother Earth healed me and really, really took care of me, and I was not doing so great, and um, I just, I couldn't get over it. And, you know, there's some things I don't, I mean, I remember camping in 20 below, you know, in, in Quincy that we built in the Adirondack Mountains, and I was just like, what am I, you know, did I sign up for this? Are you kidding? You know, because it's like right. crazy, but it's those moments. It's those moments where you're just not freezing and that you just ate that bagel and you're just having that moment, whether it's five minutes out of the whole day and it makes it all worthwhile. Right. And I think um, it just reminds us of the power of this planet and how divine it is, you know, looking at the ecosystem, looking at nature mm-hmm. and just how powerful it is and how beautiful it is and how duality works in a cyclical way. Mm-hmm. And it's just like death is cyclical. And just right. to look at all that, it's just so reassuring to just what we go through on the deepest of levels. It really brings a power of our own, um, our own being, our own strength, our own soul forward. I remember we used to have to tra- tie our food between trees so that the bears wouldn't eat them. And right. the bears were like everywhere. And so at night we would be by the fire looking up at the, you know, up at the stars. And I remember just looking and waiting for the stars to fall and looking at the Milky Way and 
Those were amazing times. Ah. And, and, and children, when they seem to have inter, inner strife within themselves, they do have amazing programs called wilderness programs, different ones. And a lot of people are sent on those. They're brilliant. They really should be done more. So I'm, yeah. glad, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, it's it's time to go on another one, I think. I know, I'm just thinking, I'm like, God, where's my tent? Yeah, exactly, exactly, it's wonderful. Um, we were talking about, um, before we started the show, about your uh, grandfather, Ike. I remember my those. grandfather. Yeah, I remember those, um, even into the 60s and 70s, I like Ike was still, you know, the, the thing that was going through the... Uh, the media, or at least, you know, in people's homes, because our parents grew up with, with that saying, I like Ike, um, which is your great-grandfather. So um, can you talk a little bit about the, about the past, um, how you discovered these conspiracies that you wanted to reveal to the world, that you wanted to share and bring out? Okay, well, uh, 2006. I was recruited to go off planet, and I know this is when people start to say, I don't know about her, that sounds kind of crazy, but, you know, we need to sort of get more comfortable with these sort of far out ideas. We're in 2013, and we're dealing with a whole world that's been kept very secret to us. Mm -hmm. And um, so in 2006, I went to a festival, and I met somebody who was actually sent on, on a specific mission to lure me into a project, um, which dealt with colonizing Mars like 2012. At that time, you know, that was six years previous to um, 2012. Uh, I knew that that, you know, that when I first was presented with it, I didn't take it very seriously. You know, I didn't know how secretive it was. I didn't know about the black ops that much, except for from movies. There was no Project Camelot or whistleblowers at the time. And I was just like, and he was talking to a handler and called him a handler. And I'm like, wait a second, that sounds, I'm like, okay. And there was these secret meetings going on and, you know, all this talk about going to Mars and that we needed to go. And all the emails were, you know, bringing up all these different technologies that I'd never heard of, like looking glass technologies and things like the Orion Cube. And, you know, that we had to leave and it was, you know, for my protection. And But it got really intense and I could tell that he was under some sort of programming because he would get phone calls and disappear for days. And, okay, so just to make a long story short, I refused to go. I had some dreams that really alerted me that, you know, I have a, you know, I have a mission here on Earth and there's just no way. And I made the choice and and then, you know, following that, it was very clear that they knew that I was on to them. And then everything changed. I was leaked information. It was like all the stuff started to change. And I found out that the names that he was dealing with were people that were connected to technologies like HARP and um, mind control and psychotronic weaponry and even artificial telepathy. And that's what I was thinking that he was connecting with in order to pull off this mission. So that was really an eye-opener. And once I sort of survived that and got through that, which was not easy, I really just put my head in this stuff, and I really just started to delve into it and discovered that in the Eisenhower administration, something called Alternative 3 was set up, which had to do with um, establishing colonies off-planet. Mm -hmm. Alternative 2 had to do with underground bases. And this had to do with the treaties and, you know, the secret government. And we found out more from whistleblowers lately that uh, Eisenhower actually wanted to invade Area 51 to see what was going on because once there was a certain exchange of technology, everything went underground and it was like out of his hands. Mm -hmm. And that's why he gave the speech about the warning of the military industrial complex. So here I come along and I'm, you know, up against certain deeper layers of that military industrial complex. And then I'm thinking, well, the only thing growing up that I really heard was the speech, but not all the hidden layers that I somewhat stumbled upon that no other family member right. um, was dealing with. So that really connected me to, okay, well, this is what a speech means. This is how it relates to the ET treaty. And it has to do with the exchange of technology, time travel, teleportation, and establishing colonies of uh, planet in order to, to establish a new world order on Earth, which is absolutely what he did not want. Mm -hmm. So I knew that, okay, well, the game stops here. The military industrial complex, I'm going to, like, do my best to crumble, you know, and I know right. we all are, but, yeah, that's how I got in touch with the people here. So. so the um, alternative three, that's really wild. Alternative two... Um, isn't that where, and this is just, I'm not as affluent about um, the alien ET stuff that other people are that I'm connected to, but isn't that where a lot of, you said underground base, that's where a lot of the, um, a lot of the races that consider themselves to be, um, as planet Earth being their original home, since they were here long before us, that's where they live, is underground, Correct. Yeah, um, the, there's like seven different species of reptilians and the ones yeah. that...
self-native are not the service to self ones. I think the service mm-hmm. to self ones are more connected with the Anunnaki and the fallen watchers that joined in with the Luciferian rebellion that happened first. And then that's all like these control agendas that we're dealing with with the Illuminati. But they're actually mm-hmm. in fear of the reptilians that live further below the earth that Better. actually want to wipe most of humanity out because right. they can tell that we're hurting her. And they don't mm-hmm. seem bad, but they're just not into, you know, what's taking place. So there's a lot of underground bases, you know, underground cities that were established when Atlantis sank. And so um, I think these underground bases were new ones that they wanted to establish, like Dulce and I think things mm-hmm. at Area 51, and they had to do with more uh, the service to self beings mm-hmm. that were orientated more towards the elite and our enslavement. Now, Area 51 and, and your great-grandfather being president, he would have full access to that, correct? He didn't. Um, there's a, a video that just came out. Um, Richard Dolan interviewed somebody called Anonymous, who used to work uh, for, um, I guess, the CIA. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you can Google it, or YouTube it, and basically uh, the things got out of hand when MJ-12 really took the power. You know, the power of the presidency was, like, gone. And that's why Kennedy was assassinated, because Eisenhower tried to brief him about the UFO thing. He tried to really just bring a lot of this out there, and, and, it, and it wasn't going to happen. I mean, everything sort of ended in that administration after the Second World War, because the war wasn't really won. The beings just ended up moving over. Lots of scientists came over with uh, Project Paperclip. And so he didn't have access, you know, and he's considered the scapegoat. There's actually a lot of quotes that he wrote about, you know, scapegoats and how they try and just put it all on one person and these sort of uh, type of things. I don't know if he was exactly referring to that, but, uh, you know, once there was uh, technology exchange happening, the power really became the power of the military and the Pentagon and these hidden organizations, and he didn't have any power after that, and uh, that's why everything was shut down. Even scenes from Venus came in the 1960s, and there's going to be a movie coming out, and the mm-hmm. producer of the movie has had contact with those scenes and the person that wrote the book, Frank Stranges. I'm, 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 I have heard about that, right, yes. That's yeah, the Valiant Thor. Yeah, Valiant Thor and the beings from Venus. And yes. Eisenhower and Nixon put them in the Pentagon for three and a half years and tried to help them mm-hmm. in their cause. Right. And then they got shut down. So, mm-hmm. I mean, we're dealing with some pretty heavy-duty power, but uh, now really we're, I think we're really recognizing that the power is in our hands. If we sit there and wait for the government to solve it, you know, they're going to be mm-hmm. shut down uh, and it's up to us to rise because we're the ones that are the popular opinion and we give them our power we don't. Right. So right. we got to make those choices. Now, there's much talk about um, Obama being invited or actually going to Mars as a teenager. Are you familiar with that information, or is that anything you can discuss? Yeah, or- well, Andrew Bichago has been a <clears throat> right. you know, colleague and friend of mine for a couple of years, so we've done some conferences together. I've helped him sort out a lot of this information about Barry Satoro that was in the Mars training program with him in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was like Barry Satoro, Regina Dugan, is that her name, uh, Brett Stillings, Andrew Bichago. And they were up at College of the 50s in Mount Shasta mm-hmm. going in uh, with these training programs. Um, and Ed James was their instructor, and they were learning how to handle being on the surface of Mars. And they said, you know, Obama was in the classroom. His name was, you know, Barry Satoro. He went to Occidental College. You know, all the things mm-hmm. you do hear about, mm-hmm. and that he was on Mars. In fact, he did, you know, jump um, to Mars. But the thing mm-hmm. is, a lot of those memories are erased, and mm-hmm. Andrew and Brett were able to recall all that, and they've just done so much work to try and bring all this up. Um, and, and they're both, you know, saying the same thing. So when you say jump, are you talking about the Mars uh, teleportation? Yeah, and it's like an elevator, and it takes yes. about 20 minutes yes. just to get you there. And also, do you, do you believe that Andrew um, Asiago is going to be president in 2016? I think he's got a good chance, for sure. Uh-huh, Very um, cool. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Uh, but there's a lot to, to, to really look at about all that and these technologies and you know, there, there's another whistleblower, Bernard Mendez, is talking about how the gray alien technology is able to simulate environments mm-hmm. that seem to be right. real. They're right. even questioning if it was actually, you know, what, what was this? Was it really Mars? And so mm. what's really important for anybody who's talking about the truth is to keep an open mind. You know, don't just stick to your story and, and, like, not have an open mind to what maybe the story really means. And that's right. what I love about Andy Vichago because he does that, which means that he's open to the truth. He's just sorting it out, but he's brilliant. He's really articulate and... Right. And they've all been through a lot, you know. And I guess in 1972, a year before I was born, I was identified in Project Pegasus, which was the project that he was involved in as mm-hmm. a child. Mm-hmm. And being pre-identified, I think, meant that I was, because I could feel this my whole life, that there was basically some sort of targeting, which later led to the recruitment in 2006. And that's why we ended up working together, because we saw how our stories connect. Right. 
So would you share with us um, more about the Ascension Project? Oh, yeah. Um, well, we're in um, an Ascension window period. It's called the Stellar Activation Cycle. Right. And uh, I think the dates are between 2000 and 2017. And what that really represents is sort of this opening of the natural stargate. You know, the planetary body is now in alignment with the galactic plane, and that's what big hype about 2012 was about. But this is also a date where there's been a lot of attention from the elite and the Illuminati to, you know, put down the clamps and enslave humanity. So, you know, it's like either you buy into the programs, which sort of lower your density, which means that it's easier to be affected by chemtrails and all the different things mm -hmm. that they're trying to assault us with, or we ride that organic wave and we connect with nature and our spirit and our own inner divinity, and we begin to move through what's called accretions, which upgrades our DNA and helps us to really um, advance ourselves and recognize that we're the advanced technology. So mm -hmm. it's like the world of technology and the world of ascension. You know, in the ascension world, there's technologies, but they're based on sound, frequency, color, vibration. In the artificial timeline world and the sort of the prison planet agenda, technology is all about mind control, weather control, and using free energy and our own personal power and energy as a weapon. So we give it away, and then they use it against us. So um, it's critical right now for uh, beings to really be informed and make, you know, wise choices. The right. positive timeline, the ascension timeline is the most natural. It's, it's, it's always there. It's, it's real. Mm -hmm. The other stuff has been manufactured and engineered, and um, it's a very dangerous trap. So we have, you know, a couple more years in this uh, window period, and it's not like fear, doom, gloom if people don't make it. I mean, this 3D world is very much like a school, but I don't even like to use that term because the evils that take place, it's like, no, that's not the dark teacher. That's, like, wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. But the way that we can work with it can be on that level, and that way we're not the effect of it. Right. And that's based on the tree of knowledge, the duality of good and evil, and destroying the tree of life, which is our DNA, and our kundalini going up the spine, mm -hmm. and sacred union within, and these are all the big key points to remember and to um, embrace in this ascension process, because union balances everything. Even though it sounds so simple, and people think it's all fluffy, new agey stuff, it's, um, it's not. It's, it's just nature, it's physics, it's like our own bodies, when we're in balance, we don't attract as much germs, disease, and chaos. Right. So, so with the chemtrails and, and now all the protests that are coming up, and you've seen history, and from a very good vantage point, do you believe that that this is a that these protests that are going on to eliminate the chemtrails? Do you think that they'll have much impact? Well, I mean, we're, we're talking about hitting controllers. We're talking about off-planet mm -hmm. uh, energies. We're talking about really powerful technologies. Um, I, I don't know what that's really going to do, but I think the good thing is that it, it, it starts to get people thinking. Like, what, what are these people protesting? What, right. what are, oh, what, the stuff up in the sky? I thought those were contrails, or I thought that was like a, an air show. You know, it's like, right. come on. It's, been, it's a really long air show since the 1970s. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, it's like, <laughs> and getting worse every day. <laughs> and, and getting worse. And people are sick, and it's just, right. you know, it really draws attention to what's really happening. And I think mm -hmm. we're not going to necessarily be able to, you know, take all that down, but we can certainly get the attention away from the matrix, away from government lies, conspiracies uh, that creates false flags that people buy as regular news, away right. from all the media distortions of the masculine and feminine. We can start to just abandon all that and look for ourselves. And then our frequency raises above mm -hmm. all these different assaults. And just like we were talking about with dark forces, we initiate ourselves beyond this sort of imprisonment. Because really, the mind and the ego imprisons us. So this mm -hmm. is like the metaphor that's manifesting. And we have a choice. Spirit, you know, is way stronger than all right. this. Exactly. So we just have to take our attention away from it, but I think all this is serving us, but I don't think it's going to, like, say, oh, well, look at all these people that are mad. Maybe we should stop spraying. It's like, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. It's more like, you know, but it's going to inform the masses, and then hopefully they'll listen to enough people to recognize where their energy and attention should go without the fear. Right. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Now, I have a, something that came to me. Do you at all have any sense, as a lot of us spiritual beings believe in incarnation, do you believe that um, your great grandfather's incarnate in you? Huh. People have said that. Um, I just saw it. That's why I asked you about 15 minutes ago. Oh, that's so funny. I think we just share a lot of similar energy. We're both Libras. We, mm -hmm. We're both all about justice, freedom. I mean, we, we have similar ideas, ideals. Um, I don't really, I don't find myself flashing back on mm -hmm. past lives okay. compared to other past lives. Mm -hmm so much, but like I feel so immersed in, in this path and I feel like, you know, we're kind of in this together that, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell one from the other because we're just like, I mean, I feel like we're a team, but I, I can't say I really feel that. I mean, because I did feel his presence when I was young and 
And um, I went to a psychic institute once, and nobody knew that I was related to him. And they said, Eisenhower's in the room. And they said, and I said, really? And I said, later on, I said, well, I'm related to him. They said, oh, well, he stands right there with you. And mm-hmm. oh, it makes sense, then, if you're related to him. I was like, oh, cool, okay. And just That's stuff beautiful. like that. So, yeah. yeah. My father, I was in a situation where I was told that my father stands on my left side all the time. So Aww. it's it's amazing when he passed when I was thirteen. So the power and love that um, they have for us from the beyond coming here is it's brilliant. It's beautiful. It really so, is. It really moves me, and I, I just yeah. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining us, and we'd love to have you back. You're fascinating. Very very fascinating. There's a lot of content in this thirty minute show today. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved it. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you.